Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag uh, show of AMC Movie Talk, where all we do is take your questions and comments from the chat board. My name is John Campia. I am the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I am so glad you decided to stop in and make us a part of your day. Um, we've started the show, so we're up and running. Thank you so much to all you guys who are joining us live. I uh, really appreciate you guys being here and being a part of the show today. Um, last night, uh, today is Sunday, March the 9th, and as you know, there was no mailbag yesterday on Saturday, and the reason there was no mailbag on Saturday was because we had a very special event yesterday where we did a live um, interview, half-hour interview of Guardians of the Galaxy with star Chris Pratt, director James Gunn, and the president of Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige. And they all came into the studio last night. Uh, I got some pictures here I'll show you. They came in, and uh, we did this Q&A. As you can see, there's me with Chris Pratt beside me, James Gunn across from him, and Kevin Feige in the hat. Had such a good time with these guys last night. I, I mean, seriously, it was one of the most fun things I have ever done. Um, and, you know, I've been movie blogging and doing, you know, being a movie pundit online for over 10 years now. And I can probably, in all honesty, say last night was the most fun I've ever had doing my job. I mean, I, I was even a moderator on a panel at Comic-Con in Hall H once, and this was more fun than that. This was more fun than that. Um, had a chance to hang out with the guys a bunch too. They hung out like for like an hour afterwards, and uh, they, you know, they hung out with us in the back. And there's a, another shot of me with Chris, James, and Kevin. Such a good time. And for those of you, I mean, you know, we do a little thing around here. We've got a nickname for ourselves, and those of us who watch uh, AMC uh, Movie News, we call ourselves the Sons of AMC. Well, we patched in a new member last night of the Sons of AMC, and that was Star-Lord, Chris Pratt. Uh, as you can see here, we, we gave him his patch. We gave him his shirt, the Sons of Anarchy, uh, which is uh, really great. He was really excited about it, too. He loved it. He said, man, seriously, I'm going Harley riding tomorrow. i got to wear this. I'm like, awesome, great, go for it. So that was so great. Now, if you missed the live stream, no worries. Just look on our YouTube page, and you'll see the live um, Guardians of the Galaxy chat that we did. Like I said, it was a little over a half hour. They revealed a bunch of stuff. So much great insight. It was really funny. These guys were great. And uh, I am so glad that so many of you guys joined us for that last night. So with that all out of the way, we are here today to take movie questions and questions about the movie world. Sorry, I forgot to put these glasses on. By the way, sometimes you may not know, you'll notice when I do these shows here, uh, in Studio B, which is the studio here at my place, I, I wear these these glasses. They're not sunglasses. They're um, I get a bunch of people ask me all the time, what what are these glasses? These are gunners. They're called. I believe it's G U N N A R. I might be wrong on the spelling there, but basically what they do, they're primarily made for video game players uh, because it filters out a certain type of light that comes off of monitors and can give you eye fatigue and give you headaches. And I have several giant 27-inch monitors in front of me that I work in front of. And when I uh, do shows from here, I like to wear these because they just prevent me from getting headaches, which is really nice and good for me. Uh, all right, so with all that out of the way, it's time to get questions. But I want to let you know, too, I've pulled a bunch of questions out of the mailbag. So we're going to answer about five or six of them. But then, after I'm done that part, I'm going to invite you guys who are watching live, and I know there are several hundred of you watching live right now. Um, you can get on Twitter... And tweet to me, here it is here, tweet to me right now at AMC Movie News. So tweet a live question to at AMC Movie News, and when I'm done the mailbag questions, I'll uh, hop on the Twitter stream and I'll pull questions tweeted at AMC Movie News and pull questions from there for, for a little while. So with all that being said, let's jump into question number one today. And question number one today comes to us from Taylor Hudson, or Houston, who writes... Um, hey guys, do you think that Uncharted will be made into a movie one day? I love the game series, and I really am interested in seeing a motion picture being made. Well, then, uh, good news, T Taylor. Um, it's coming. They, they, uh, the rights have been bought, and they are developing uh, an Uncharted movie. Now, developing is a big step away from greenlit and setting a release date and all that kind of stuff. They're not at that point yet. But I do know that they are working on a movie. 
uh, at, at developing right now. They're in, in that those stages of the film right now. They're trying to get it pulled together and then get all their ducks in a row and then they can hold it up to the studio powers that be and say, this is what we're doing, give us the green light, and the studio either says yes or no, and then they move forward and start shooting it. Um, so that's where they're at. The plan is to do one. So good news for you, an Uncharted movie most likely is coming. Uh, we don't really know much about it other than that. Uh, as soon as we know more stuff, we will let you know. But I know this is one of those video games that a lot of fans have been asking for to be made into a movie. Now, I've watched friends of mine play Uncharted a lot, but what I hear from people who have played Uncharted is they say it, it is very much a cinematic type of game. Uh, and is one of those rare games that has a ton of narrative to it. And, so, and you've got a very likable lead character that you can market around and you can build around. Um, and I'm sure, you know, for Uncharted, I think his name's Drake, uh, this will be one of those characters that a lot of people, once they announce it and greenlight this film, this will be one of those characters I think a lot of people start speculating and arguing and debating about who should play the lead in this. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. So keep your eyes and ears open. And as soon as we know more, we will let you know more. All right, let's move on to question number two. And question number two today comes to us from Joe Mahoney, who writes, Hello, AMC. I love the show. My question is, in the end of the Fantastic Four reboot, could we see James McAvoy in his wheelchair as Professor X talking to Reed Richards, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic, Miles Teller, and McAvoy telling him about his school for mutants and saying we should meet soon to talk about a team-up? Then the film ends, leaving the fans wanting more. Thoughts? Well, do I believe that specific scenario is going to happen? No, I, I, I don't. I don't think James McAvoy will roll up in the wheelchair and say, "Hey, let's talk about a team up." I don't think that'll happen. Um, but I do believe, and I believe they've said as much. Fox is now working towards building their own cinematic universe. So they have the X Men and they have Fantastic Four. And what they are planning to do with this Fantastic Four reboot is to say it happens in the same universe as where the X-Men live. Now, I don't believe we're going to see any X-Men in the new Fantastic Four film, but I do know that that's what this is all setting up towards. It's all setting up towards uh, a, a big cinematic shared universe that we will at some point see big crossover and all those types of things. But I think that this movie is just going to be set up. Now... Could an after credit scene happen where Wolverine shows up or Iceman shows up or something along those lines? Yes, but I just don't think it'll be that specific thing where, <coughs> pardon me, you'll see James McAvoy going, hey, let's team up. I don't think that's going to happen, but I do believe we'll see something probably in an after credit scene. And then if Fantastic Four is good, and that's a big if, but when you got a director like Josh Trank on it, I have a lot of hope. Uh, I mean, everybody knows I I'm not happy that they're going with the young Fantastic Four babies. I'm not happy about that. But that doesn't mean the movie can't still be awesome. I just think it has a better chance of being awesome if they go with the more classic Fantastic Four. But they're going young. Okay, that's fine. Let, it's, it's still got a chance to be awesome. Let's hope it turns out awesome and let's see. Uh, and if it does turn out awesome, once again, big if, but if it does turn out awesome, then Fox will be thrilled and they will start going full steam ahead with their plans for their own shared uh, universe with X-Men and Fantastic Four. And Really, you got a lot to play with there because the X-Men universe is so vast and so big. And I know the Fantastic Four and the rights to the Fantastic Four carry a lot of auxiliary characters as well. So I think we're going to see some pretty cool stuff there. But the first big hurdle that they got to overcome is can they make this movie good? And that's the first step. Make the movie good and everything's fine. You know, they say in sports, uh, nothing solves fans' problems than winning, more than winning. You know, they can be doing this wrong, this wrong. The team wins, the fans are happy. And everything else everything else works itself out if you win. Um, and with the Fantastic Four and, you know, a lot of the complaining that's been going on about old Fantastic Four movies, justifiably so, um, and concerns about how they're putting this universe together, whatever, all those fears and complaints and whining and bitching go away if they make a great movie. If they make a great movie, suddenly we'll all forget all about our problems. I'll forget about my moaning that they're going with the young Fantastic Four. You'll forget about your moaning that, I, I don't know, that they should just give it back to Marvel Studios. We'll all forget all of our moaning and complaining if the movie is awesome. And that's the first step. And if they do that, cures everything. All right, let's move on to question number three. And question number three comes to us from Preston Porter. And Preston writes... Hey, AMC, my question is, 
Do you think the Hunger Games films, the the Hunger Games film series, would be as great slash popular as it is if Jennifer Lawrence wasn't the lead? To me, she portrays the role of uh, Katniss as a more believable character than un- other actresses could. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Preston. And look, I am one of those guys who I believed um, I liked the first Hunger Games movie. I wasn't doing backflips over it, but I liked it. I really liked uh, the, the second Hunger Games film. I was, I'm a big fan of the second Hunger Games film. It's one of those rare films where the second film, the sequel, is even better than the first. That doesn't happen often, but it does happen, and this is one of those cases. I, I think it's great, and I, I'm a big fan of Jennifer Lawrence. I've been a huge fan of hers ever since she was in uh, Winter's Bone. I, I know a lot of you guys still haven't seen that. Check it out. I mean, that's the one that really burst her onto the scene and put her in, in, in the public consciousness, and she's terrific in it. She's you know terrific in everything she's in. She's an Academy Award-winning actress, and she is wonderful as Katniss. I think she does a great job as Katniss. But to get to your specific question, can, would, could the Hunger Games be as good or as popular if it was somebody else? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Absolutely it could be just as good or better, and it could be just as popular or more pop- popular if somebody else was in the role. Now, not just anybody else in the role, but you know, a very good, talented actress that they got that, that would fit the role well and, and really bring Katniss to life, absolutely it could have been just as good or better and could have been just as popular or more popular. You know, a lot of things, if we, we had this big discussion going on when it looked like Robert Downey Jr. was going to leave the Iron Man franchise, but it happens all the time. You get somebody playing a character and they're good at it, and then suddenly film fans will, will say stuff like, only this person can play this role. Only Christian Bale can be Batman. Only Robert Downey Jr. can be Iron Man. Only Jennifer Lawrence can be Katniss. And that's, it's just not true. It's just not true. It's just that that's what we've seen. And we've seen that that has worked. And that has worked well. Christian Bale is Batman. Robert Downey Jr. is Iron Man. Jennifer Lawrence is Katniss. We as audience, we get to see that. And we know that it worked. And we know that in those situations, they were awesome. But that does not preclude the idea that somebody else might have been even more awesome. Look, here's what I always say. Uh, Let's take the Robert Downey Jr. situation for a second. Um, Or or let's even go to something else. I don't know. Pick pick another role. uh, uh, well, we all seem to like Daniel Craig as James Bond. Okay, so you know, we got some people. Only Daniel Craig can be James Bond. This is what I say. What if, for whatever reason, in those meetings when they were fi- making their final decision about who was going to be the new James Bond, and they ended up casting, I don't know, let's say Chris Pine for argument's sake. Okay, for argument's sake, let's say that it came down to Chris Pine and Daniel Craig. And they had to choose between those two actors, who's going to be the next James Bond. And let's say that discussion went the other way and they actually ended up getting Chris Pine. And Chris Pine, is he nails it. He's the new James Bond uh, for, um, uh, for, for the cinematic franchise. Instead of Daniel Craig, they pick Chris Pine and they have the first movie that he's doing and it's just awesome. It's Casino Royale with Chris Pine, and he does great in it. He nails it, absolutely nails it. The film's a big success. People really like him and all that kind of stuff, and sure enough, a lot of people would be going, only Chris Pine can be James Bond, but little did they know that they almost cast another guy by the name of Daniel Craig who also would have been awesome and probably even better than Pine was, but we don't see that, right? We didn't see Daniel Craig as James Bond. We saw Chris Pine, and so he becomes our standard, and we think only Chris Pine can be James Bond, but little do we know that there was another actor that they almost cast named Daniel Craig who would have actually even been better. But what we do as film fans quite often is just deal with what's in front of us. We don't think outside of that. We only think of what's right in front of us. And while I love Jennifer Lawrence, and I think she's immensely talented, and she's going to be a prime A-list, she's going to be a Hall of Famer someday. Um, She's amazing, and I love her as Katniss in The Hunger Games, they knocked it out of the park. But never will I say or agree with anybody who says that only Jennifer Lawrence can be Katniss because for all we know, somebody else that could have been pretty close to getting the role instead of her might have even done a better job. 
It's hard to imagine because we see Jennifer Lawrence playing Katniss, and she's great in it. So it's difficult for us to imagine that somebody else might have even been better. But absolutely, there is, trust me, there is always somebody who might have done a little bit better. Always. No exceptions. There is always somebody else who may have done it just a little bit better. Um, and I think that's important for us to keep in mind. And, and I, think it's, I think actors keep that in mind as well, that when they get a role, they're blessed because they know there's always somebody else out there who might have done even just a little bit better of a job than them. And I think that's great. And uh, so, no, I will never say that only this actor can play this role. I'll never buy into that theory whatsoever. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Michael Fernandez, who writes... Hello, sons and daughters of AMC. My question is about movies that are not reviewed. In my local paper, they have movies which do not have stars and say that the movie was not reviewed. Need for Speed is one of these movies, and in my experience, when a movie is not reviewed, aren't that good. Do to the movie companies uh, do the movie companies do this on purpose? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, uh, actually, yeah, absolutely, you're right. I've been saying that for a long time. Most studios will screen 95% of their movies, pardon me, um, for critics to review. Almost all films do that. Very, very rarely will a studio not screen a movie for critics before the movie comes out. And I have said for 10 years now that when that happens, take that as a giant red flag that this movie sucks. Because what it is saying, that is the studio sending a message um, that we don't believe in this movie. We don't believe that anybody's going to like this movie and therefore we can't let word get out about how bad our movie is. We can't let word get out about that. So don't show it to the critics. Don't let it get reviewed before opening weekend. Launch it. Trick as many people as in the public as possible to buy their tickets and come to see the movie anyway. And then word of mouth can get out about how bad the movie is. But let's try to trick as many people as possible to get into the theater on the opening weekend. Don't show it to critics. And that, that's exactly what... That is the message that studios send to me as an audience member when they will not let critics see it. It's like, well then the, even the studio doesn't believe in this film. Even they don't like this film, and they know no one's going to like it, so they're not showing it to the critics because they don't want the word to get out that this movie is bad and lower their opening weekend box office. They want to just trick as many people to come in as possible and make as much money as they can as fast as they can before the negative word of mouth gets out. Now, um, but then you mentioned Need for Speed. Well, remember, Need for Speed doesn't come out for over another week um, or, or for another week. A lot of times studios will let the critics see the films well in advance but say, hey, listen, because we're coordinating our marketing campaign, we want you to release your reviews about this movie in the same week that the movie opens. Because then that, that makes sense. I have no problem with that. I have no problem if they say, hey, write your review two months in advance. And I have no problem if they say, hey, write your review the week of the movie because we want people talking about the movie in the week that it's opening. And Need for Speed is one of those situations where uh, they have screened Need for Speed. Believe me, they have. I have seen screenings of Need for Speed. I like Need for Speed. Um, actually, my whole crew did. We all like Need for Speed. We all thought it was quite good. I, I'm not willing to say that it, Need for Speed is as good as Fast and the Furious 4. Or sorry, I'm not willing to say that Need for Speed is as good as Fast and Furious 5, nor is it as good as Fast and the Furious 6. But I will say this. It is better than Fast and Furious 1, 2, 3, and 4. Fast and, uh, fa um, Need for Speed is a good, entertaining movie. And when you watch it, keep in mind the whole time you're watching this film, no CGI. What you're seeing on screen is actual real cars with actual real drivers doing actual real stunts. Director Scott Waugh, his whole career he's been a stuntman. His dad before him was, as, as Scott calls him, the greatest Hollywood stuntman of all time. Um, so he really believed in doing real on-screen cars, real on-screen stunts with real stuntmen. And when you watch the movie with that in mind, it is incredible, the stuff they pull off in this film. Um, so like, I'm not going to jump up and down and say, woohoo, 10 out of 10, Need for Speed. Nah, I'm not going to do that. 
but I was entertained. I was entertained by Need for Speed, and I really do think most people will be too. Um, so, so check it out. But Need for Speed is one of those movies just where, yeah, maybe yesterday or two or three days ago there weren't any reviews out, but trust me, in the coming days, reviews are going to come out en masse um, so people can see and read them. And, and I don't believe Need for Speed is a movie for everybody. I, I don't believe it's going to have like an 80% on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm guessing the Rotten Tomato rating on Need for Speed is going to be in the mid to high 60s. That's my guess. I could be totally wrong. But uh, after watching the movie, knowing that I liked it and I was entertained by it, and knowing that it's not for everybody, my guess is going to be around the 68% mark. But I suggest watching it and watch it with that whole thing in mind, that all, everything you're seeing is real, and it really just heightens the experience uh, all that much more. But anyway, let's move on, shall we? Uh, oh, before we move on, I just want to remind you once again, if you're watching us live via uh, uh, on, on YouTube, you can tweet in some live questions. After I'm done the sixth mailbag question, I'm going to go to uh, to Twitter stream, and you guys can send in questions to AMC Movie News, at AMC Movie News on Twitter, and I'll pull a bunch of questions from there, and we'll just interact live for a while to end off the show. So let's move on for now to the next mailbag question. The next mailbag question comes to us from Dejan uh, Borjanovic, who writes... Recently, we've been seeing two things uh, that the recent Disney slash Pixar animations have been considered mediocre by audiences, Cars 2, Brave, and Monsters University. I, I, I got to disagree. I don't think people thought Brave was mediocre. I thought it was good. And I don't think people thought Monsters University was mediocre. I thought Monsters University was very good. Not as good as the first one, but very good. But anyway, on the other hand, the last few films by Disney Animation Studios, not Pixar, have received critic and audience acclaim. Tangled, Wreck-It Ralph, and most recently, Frozen. What do you think these trends mean? Will Disney slowly start to move away from Pixar and focus more on Disney Animation Studios since the last three films by Pixar were not considered on par with their previous work? And the last three films by Disney Animation Studios have fared far better than the Pixar films. Good question, uh, Dejan. But there, there's, there's something you got to keep in mind here, too. When we're talking about... Um, you know, Disney Studios and Pixar Studios, and who's doing well? Okay, let's sit down and take a, a look at the track record for the last few films. Cars 2, not so good. Brave, a good film. Uh, not great, good film. I thought Monster University was a very good film. Was it outstanding and amazing? No, but I thought it was a very good film, and I liked it. Tangled, very good. Wreck-It Ralph, outstandingly good. Frozen, v a great film. Frozen's great, I love it. When you're taking that sample size, it's clear that Disney Animation Studios are doing a little bit better right now than Pixar Animation Studios. But you got to keep this in mind. It's the same head office. Remember, when, when Disney and Pixar merged and Disney took over Pixar, part of that takeover was that John Lasseter, the head of Pixar became the grand high emperor of all things animation when it came to Disney. So John Lasseter is the head now of Disney Animation Studios, and he is the head of Pixar Animation Studios, and he's got a team that shepherds and oversees both. So, and you know, he's the final decision maker on everything. So all those films essentially come from his desk. He's not the one who created them, but they all flow and got to go through John Lasseter. And so while... While there is Disney Animation Studios and while there is Pixar Studios, as each year goes by, the distinction between the two is becoming more and more blurred. And I'm going to say this. I believe three years from now, there will no longer be a Pixar Animation Studios. Just because, and not that it will disappear, but it's just going to be absorbed and they're just going to call all of it just Disney Animation is what they're going to call it. Pixar is just going to be absorbed and it's all just going to be Disney Animation. Uh, because the lines are becoming more and more blurred. When you look at, down the executive list, there are people who have feet in both Disney Animation and Pixar. So it's hard to say one is doing better than the other because they're really all coming from the same place. Now, early in the merger, early after uh, Disney took over Pixar, they were still functioning very distinctly for a little while. But th that distinction has become more and more crossed. I mean, Brave felt a lot more like a Disney film than it did a Pixar film. And Wreck-It Ralph feels a lot more like a Pixar film than a Disney animation film because they've got all this cross-talent going on now. The executives are in both. you got a lot of talent doing both. 
it's I believe in three, four, five years, there's not going to be a distinction between them anymore. It's just going to be Disney animation. Not Disney Animation Studios, not Pixar Studios. You're just going to have Disney Animation. Because that's essentially, that's kind of the way they're functioning now uh, in many ways. And I could be wrong about all that, but that's just, that's just the way I see it and the way I kind of believe it's going to work out. All right, let's move on to the final mailbag question today. And the final mail, mailbag question today comes to us from Jeremy Stokes, who writes, I was wondering how certain directors are able to jump from low-budget filmmaking straight into big-budget films. Mark Webb is a good example of this. Maybe even James Gunn. Um, Mark went from 500 Days of Summer into Spider-Man without blinking. Am I right in thinking that fundamentally filmmaking is the same regardless of size? Otherwise, how do they know what the hell they're doing? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And you brought up, Jeremy, you bring up two great examples of this. Guys who come from smaller budget filmmaking into big budget filmmaking. Mark Webb, you know, 500 Days of Summer, simple, smaller budget film, big success, into the Amazing Spider-Man. James Gunn from Super, Slither, into Guardians of the Galaxy. And, you know what, last night um, during the, uh, the Q&A that I did with um, uh, Kevin Feige, James Gunn, and Christopher Pratt, the question did come up to Kevin Feige. It's like, what made James Gunn the right director. I mean, he'd always just done really smaller stuff. And Kevin Feige, you can watch a video for yourself, but essentially what Kevin Feige said was, because we want to find great storytellers. Essentially, when it comes to it, directing is directing. Now, remember, James Gunn isn't going to be doing the green screen and, and modeling the CG animated characters that they need and, and doing the explosion special effects himself. That's not how it works. He gets a team put around him that can do that. The director's job is to work with the actors to get the best performance out of them, guide the ship, carve the narrative, make the movie what it is. And part of that means, look, they, he tells his DP, I want this kind of a shot. So it's the DP's responsibility to make that kind of a shot. To tell the director, I want this nuance in the performance in this scene. So the actor gives him what he wants. And it's essentially the same thing when you're going to a big major blockbuster scenario with huge special effects, except that after you tell the DP what you want and after you tell the performer what he wants, you also tell your visual effects supervisor, I want a ship that's going to do this, crash into that, and have a big explosion. Okay, so now the visual effects supervisor makes sure that that happens. It's all about the director setting the vision, getting the performance out, setting the direction, and then letting this incredible team of, film, of, of other people involved in filmmaking around them, whether they're writers, set designers, script supervisors, um, actors, uh, lighting guys, gaffers, uh, you know, cinematographers, whatever, the director still sits down, lays out his vision, and then all this team of people around him then set out to carrying that vision out. So when James Gunn goes from a slither to a Guardians of the Galaxy, it's just the same thing, except now he's got a few other people he needs to give direction to, effects supervisors and people like that. But it's still the director setting his vision for the story, and then the different people around him have to go and carry it out. So when guys like Kevin Feige are looking for great directors, they're looking for great storytellers, guys who can be great directors. And they're not worried about guys who are visual effects artists because they've got visual effects artists who can carry out that director's vision. And so, uh, yeah, so I, I, once again, go and watch that 30-minute Guardians of the Galaxy interview we did last night. I mean, they share some... They, they share some great stuff, some great insight. Chris Pratt was really, really funny. So uh, look that up and, uh, and check it out. All right, guys. We're almost at a half hour here. So I want to take some time now and take some questions from the live chat board. Uh, and let's, uh, let's head over there. Let's head over to the live chat board. Where is my live chat board? There it is. Here's the chat board. All right. Let's see what you guys are asking. Uh, Daniel... Mimbella is writing, if The Amazing Spider-Man 3 blows just as much as Spider-Man 3, do you think Sony will yet again uh, reboot the franchise? Well, uh, no. No, they've got too much big plans right now because they got a they got Amazing Spider-Man 3, but they also already have Amazing Spider-Man 4 planned. They've got the Venom standalone film in the works. They've got the Sinister Six movie in the works. So they've got big plans, plus... The problem with Spider-Man 3 wasn't just that it was a bad movie, but there were other things involved in it that kind of led you to believe that its time was over. And, and I brought this up a lot, too. I think Sam Raimi, who is one of my favorite directors, um, 
I think he started to get stale on Spider-Man because we were just seeing the same things repeat themselves over and over and over again into the third film. Like, I'm the villain. I was once a good guy, but then something tragic, tragically bad happened to me, and now I'm a bad guy. That was, that was the plot of all the villains in all of his films, of all the Spider-Man films. Um, in every single one of the Spider-Man films, Mary Jane gets kidnapped by the bad guy dangled from a high place as a trap for Spider-Man who's going to come to rescue her. They literally did that in all three Spider-Man films. Uh, and and there's a lot of other stuff that just started to get repetitive that you really noticed was getting repetitive in the third film. And I think the fact that it was a really bad film, but also the fact that there were these other problems starting to rear their heads. I think Sam Raimi wanted a bigger and bigger budgets for his Spider-Man films. I think that really, it's a combination of all those things that ultimately led Sony to deciding it's time for us to reboot this and go in a new direction. With this Spider-Man, they've already got, they're so happy with where they're at and what they've done with Spider-Man 2 that they're already planning well beyond Spider-Man 3. So if Spider-Man 3 ends up being a bad film, remember, it's really hard to make a great film, let alone three great films in a row. But if Spider-Man 3 ends up being bad, that's just their first bump in the road. They'll move on and do Spider-Man 4, they'll do Venom, they'll do Sinister Six. But if you start to see a couple of crappy movies in a row, then they'll probably start thinking about when is it time to reboot again. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question, let me pull one up here. Um, uh, Sotomizer writes, are you going to do a live world premiere um, for Godzilla like what you did for Need for Speed? Uh, for those of you who don't know, we actually did a live red carpet um, presentation at Need for Speed. We were on the red carpet and we streamed it live. We had a really good time doing it. Will we do that for Godzilla? It's really up to the studios. You know, uh, Disney invited us to do this live red carpet thing for uh, Need for Speed. And it was the first one we've ever done. And we made some mistakes in it, but I expected that because it was the first time we'd ever tried something like that. But overall, I think it was a pretty good experience. We had a really good time. Um, so will we do more? That's going to be up to the studios and when the studios invite us to do it. But we wanted to do one and get it under our belt and make some evaluations. We haven't even really decided yet if we want to do more. But um, once, we, once we decide if we want to do more, then we'll open it up to the studios and say, hey, if you want us to do live coverage of your red carpets, let us know and we'll come down and do it. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today, let's see. Um, uh, Jared Robinson is asking, question... When do you think we will see a new Batman costume? The new Batman costume. That's a good question, but I don't really care. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I don't care. I'm not really all that interested. Oh no, Look, I'm curious, but I'm not really super interested. And oh my gosh, what does the new Batman costume look like? It's going to look like a ba Batman costume. You know, it's either going to be like Batman in the Lego movie says, it's either going to be black or very, very, very dark gray. I mean, it's, it's going to be a Batman costume. And they're going to come out with it, and we're going to look at it and say, look, it's a Batman costume. It, to me, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. As long as they don't make it purple and go way out of bounds to the point where you stand back and look at it and go, I can't even tell if that's Batman or not. As long as that's not the case, it's a costume. The costume is not going to make the movie any better. The costume is not going to make the movie any worse unless they put a giant cod piece on them and giant bat nipples. That was outrageously awful. But that movie was awful. The bat nipples were just an extra little cherry on top. The bat nipples were not the deciding factor between whether Batman and Robin was a good movie or a bad movie. <laughs> okay, I don't think any of us would think that. Um, so when will it come out? I don't know, probably not for a while. The movie's not coming out until 2016 now, so it's really it's not close so i don't expect we'll see it very soon and if they do great but i just hope people don't get too excited about it when they see it and i hope they don't get too negative when they see it it's the batman costume it's it's going to be what we expect it to be it's going to look like batman with a little more gray here instead of black a little more black here instead of gray i mean i i really don't see what the big deal is but i know some people some friends of mine are really excited about seeing the new batman costume just not me because it's going to be a Batman costume. I'm super excited for the movie. I I'm just don't really don't care. <laughs> as long as it's a Batman costume. That's all I care about. All right, let's go back to the Twitter stream here. And let's see what do we got here. Um, 
Um, AMC Movie News, John Campia, will we see a spoiler review for the next uh, Need for Speed? No, I don't think so. I don't think we're going to do a spoiler review for that one. Um, so, yeah. Uh, where are you going to do a live thing for that? We're check- Let me shoot to the top here. Um, Push writes, Hi, John. I wanted to know who you think is the best male comedic actor of the last decade. That's a great question. Who is the best comedic actor of the last decade? Um, it's hard not to say Will Ferrell. I mean, it, it, it kind of depends a little bit on what kind of comedy you like. But if you want to talk about being prolific and having success and having a lot of fans, Seth Rogen's been great. Kevin Hart is having a hot streak right now, but you, I, you can't talk about him for the last decade. I'm I'm probably going to go ahead and say Will Ferrell. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not I'm not willing to die for that belief though. Uh, I think <laughs> I think he's been dar- been darn successful, very consistent in how good he's been. Um, so just for now, I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say Will Ferrell. But you know, you guys in the comments section are probably going to come up with about ten other better names than that, and I'll probably agree with you. But for now, I'm going to go with Will Ferrell. All right, let's uh, go back to the Twitter, and we'll take like two more here. Um, Mark Perone is asking, have I seen the new 300 film and what did I think about it? As a matter of fact, I did see the new 300 film and I'll say this about it. Not nearly as good as the first 300, but I liked it. I I walked out entertained. Are there bad things about it? Yep. Can I understand why there's going to be a bunch of people out there that didn't like it? Yep. And I'm not going to argue with people. Like, I had my friend Matt was with us last night at the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy thing, and he hated 300. And I told him, I said, dude, I'm not going to argue with you about it because I, I can't disagree necessarily with any of the bad things you're going to bring up. I can totally see why there are going to be a lot of people who don't like this movie. I can just tell you that myself and my friend Soul Video, John Green, uh, we saw it and we liked it. We walked out going, hey, that was fun. I had a good time with it. But I can totally see why some other people won't. Uh, so I'm very curious to see how it all... The last time I checked, it was hovering around the 50% mark on Rotten Tomatoes, and that's kind of where I expect it to be. I think it's going to appeal to some people like me, and I think it's not going to appeal to other people. Um, and I could totally see that. The one thing I'll say about this, though, is that I was kind of upset and disappointed that it wasn't focusing on the Spartans. I wanted the Spartans in this movie, and I wanted 300 about Sparta. Uh, and they didn't do that. They went in another direction. That's fine. It still ended up being entertaining for me. And I'll probably go see it at least one more time. Uh, but it's not going to be for everybody. I can tell you that right now. Um, okay. Let's take one last question today. And the last question... Um, let's see. I'm going to scroll down here. Jam is writing, Is it possible that this Wonder Woman won't be Diana, just a stand-in uh, to be rid of her for the real Wonder Woman to show up in Justice League. It's not, an, it's not as outrageous as a, a, of a theory as you might think. He's saying, do you think this Wonder Woman is going to be played by Gal Gadot from Fast and the Furious? Could it be that she's not Prince, Princess Diana? Could it be she's not Diana? But it's another Amazonian with the Wonder Woman mantle, that then something happens to her, and then it opens the uh, it opens the gateway for the real Wonder Woman, Diana, to come into play in Justice League, because in the comics, remember there was a time when Artemis beat Diana to take over the mantle of Wonder Woman for a while, and Artemis uh, uh, was Wonder Woman for a long time. So Wonder Woman is is almost like a mantle for an Amazonian. It's it's possible. I don't think so, though. I think Gal Gadot is your Wonder Woman, and I think she's she's going to be Diana. I think that's the way they're doing it. But like I said, I don't think your theory is is all that far fetched. There's certainly uh, precedents there to suggest that there's some validity to your theory, and and uh, I think you need to keep that in mind. Um, okay, so and I'm going to bring up this one last one because this is important. And Curtis. Um, is asking, is versus done, AMC versus done, because you didn't do one last week and you didn't even announce the winner from the last one. Uh, we did announce the winner from the last one. I announced uh, the winner and I, I won the, the one previous to that and the last versus was the better 2012 comedy, tw- uh, 21 Jump Street or Ted. And we did announce that I won the debate. 
uh, I think it was 63% to 37% or something like that. But we also announced that we weren't going to do one last week, and we weren't going to do one this week either. We're evaluating verses right now, and I think we're going to make some changes to it. So just keep your ears open, and we'll let you know what's coming up with the verses. Uh, verses isn't done, but we're going to be making some significant changes to it because we've been you know, talking amongst ourselves, thinking about what the things we like and what we don't like about it and because it was brand new. And we've also been listening to the fans telling us what they like about it and what they don't like about it. And we're going to be doing some renovations to it. So keep your ears open. Verses will be coming back. It's just going to look different than it was and uh, look a little bit different than it did. But it is absolutely coming back. And a lot of it, when it comes back, a lot of what it will look like moving forward is going to be as a result of your input. Anyway, guys, uh, that will do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me today on AMC Mailbag. Once again, go and check out that video. The live Q&A with uh, Chris Pratt, James Gunn, and Kevin Feige. Had a remarkable time with them last night. You should go watch it. Very informative, very entertaining interview. Check it out. Uh, make sure you head on over to www.amctheaters.com because there's a lot of great movies playing in AMC Theaters right now. Head on over there for your theater ticket and movie time information. So once again, my name is John Campia. Uh, we'll be back again for AMC Movie Talk tomorrow. I won't be there. I'm taking a day off. I'm taking Monday off. Amy Rose is going to be in studio running AMC Movie Talk tomorrow uh, with John Schnepp and the Schmoes Nose guys are going to be in studio tomorrow. So you'll want to make sure you're there for AMC Movie Talk tomorrow. And then I'll be back in the studio on Tuesday. So thanks a lot, guys, for joining me today. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until next time, bye-bye.